One of the most comforting things God tells us in his word is that he not only made and rules over everything, but also that he dearly loves those that he gathers to himself to be his eternal family. In contrast with that, the most troubling fact of God's word is that some in the world he made become his enemies. There was a, a very ancient rebellion that took place in heaven and it moved to earth where humanity was infected too in the fall of Adam. And since that time, man's ideas about God have been horribly confused and distorted. Uh, pagan deities have ranged from vague cosmic forces to comic book-like superheroes. In ancient Greece and Rome, they, they believed in gods who were conceived by adulterous relationships between super gods. There were battles for supremacy, uh, jealousies, divine deceit. Uh, their deities were modeled after the image of fallen humanity. But the God revealed in the Bible is totally different than that. Uh, since the Creator is obviously totally different from His creation, and since He's infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in all His attributes as a triune being, uh, we should expect that the true God is going to be very difficult for us to describe. Uh, and so he reveals himself to us. And rather than conceiving him in terms we can see around us, we need to submit to what he tells us in his word and accept it as that. We're just finite, temporal, and changeable in all of our attributes. And uh, there, there's nothing in all of creation uh, that by its nature is just like God. So one of the hardest concepts for us to grasp is that God exists eternally as a trinity. Now the teachings of the Bible are admittedly not real easy to understand about that. Uh, attempts to compare the Trinity with things we're familiar with will always confuse the issue because it's not like anything we're familiar with. And the Bible never gives us a direct comparison of the Trinity with created things. Uh, and we shouldn't do that either. Uh, we shouldn't expect God's basic nature to, to fit into our limited minds and human experience. But there are contact points, things that he did create that he uses to help us to understand what this Trinity is like. And so it's not that the truth of the Trinity is unclear in Scripture. Uh, it's one of the most universal doctrines of Christianity. Uh, virtually all who call themselves Christians believe there's one God and three persons. Uh, the central issue of the creeds that were formulated uh, in the early church uh, focus on the, describing the Trinity and clarifying what the Bible actually says about it uh, rather than ideas that we have introduced and made up in our own minds about what God is like. And so there really isn't any doubt that the Bible teaches this basic fact. But not all understand it in the same way. Uh, our fallen nature is inclined to confuse what God said by mixing it in with non-biblical assumptions that we make. So the idea of the Trinity was not invented by the early church councils. That's a, a misrepresentation that some often make. Uh, the early councils met together to, to correct errors that had crept in about God's nature and, and to replace them with more carefully worded descriptions of what the Bible actually says. And so our understanding of the Trinity is drawn from Scripture only. It's not drawn from theological thought and speculations of committees. Uh, it's drawn by the exegesis of verses of Scripture that give us the facts and which set the boundaries uh, that limit what we can actually think and say about God. <clears throat> Uh, for example, uh, the, the redeemed are saved uh, by the decree of God the Father. And it's on the basis of the work of Jesus Christ, who's God the Son. And it's applied to us by the Holy Spirit, who is God, who indwells us after he redeems us by applying the work of Christ. And so Jesus taught us to pray to God as our Father, uh, who lives eternally in heaven. And we pray through Jesus to the Father by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we call upon God the Son to fill us and make us uh, able to do what call, God calls us to do by the work of his Holy Spirit. And uh, God the Son then intercedes for us to the Father. Uh, these are daily concerns that we ought to uh, understand. We need to know the nature of the one to whom we're praying, at least a little bit, at least what he's revealed about himself. Uh, we must know the one in whom we're actually placing our trust. And so knowing what God is is important, not just for theologians and elders and pastors, but really to every believer who prays and rests in God's faithfulness, his forgiveness, and his promises. And what's more, it's exciting to learn about the one who made us and everything else. 
and to be assured that we're loved by this triune creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Now, the Westminster Shorter Catechism puts it in very simple and plain language. Let's look at the answer to questions 5 and 6 for a moment. Uh, here, question 5, it says, Are there more gods than one? The answer is straightforward. It says, There is but only one, the living and true God. So then question 6 asks, How many persons are there in the Godhead? And the answer is, There are three persons in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one God, the same in substance, equal in power and glory. So, First, we see that there's only one true God. And one of the oldest and most basic creeds found in the Bible is back in Deuteronomy 6.4. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Sometimes this verse is called the Shema because that's the uh, first word in the Hebrew verse, uh, the way it was originally written. In fact, if you go to, uh, to some Jewish synagogues, they will often sing the Shema, which is this declaration in Deuteronomy 6.4 that uh, the Lord our God is one Lord. Uh, the word Shema, which introduces this, means hear or listen. It means uh, pay attention to what comes next. It's going to be important, kind of similar to our word words listen up. Uh, and so the, the word that begins this verse draws our attention to what follows. It's very important. And the word Lord there in this verse, if you notice in most translations, it's written in all uppercase letters. It represents the Hebrew word for Jehovah. The Hebrew word Yahweh is the best we can come up with from our modern Hebrew scholars, uh, simply written as what would be in English, Y-H-V-H. -H. And this verse says Jehovah is one. He is singular. Uh, the only God who could ever be. In fact, the first commandment back in Exodus 20, verse 3, that was given on Mount Sinai, it says you shall have no other gods before me. There are many other places in the Bible uh, that directly teaches us that there is only one God. It's hardly a truth that needs defense by those who accept the scriptures. Uh, no matter what people might personally believe, the, the scriptures are clear. There is only one true God. And he's the creator and he's the sustainer of all things. He's, he's the living and true God and nothing could be more clear. Uh, the idea of the Trinity does not teach us that there are three gods. It's often misrepresented that way by those who are anti-Trinitarian and are really outside of the biblical Christian camp. <clears throat> the second thing we see from our catechism answer is that God eternally exists as three persons. Now, this doesn't mean that God's three different people as if they were meeting as a committee. Uh, the word person here has a very technical meaning. Uh, each is a self-conscious uh, and uh, part of the Trinity and has a specific focus. The, the Son is focused on certain things. The Spirit is, is focused on doing certain things. The Father is uh, focused on specific things. And they each have a self-consciousness in that they address one another. They speak to one another. But it's not that God just shows himself in three different ways either. Uh, so he's not three different gods. He's not one God just showing himself three different ways as if, you know, sometimes he acts like a father and sometimes he's a son and sometimes he's a spirit. Uh, there is a separation uh, that differentiates one from the other. Uh, and uh, But there's mainly a differentiation between what God's nature is and everything else in the whole created universe. Now, there's no single verse in the Bible that calls these facts a trinity. That's an English word. Well, most of the words that we know are English words in theology uh, as we Americans speak of it. Uh, but some uninformed defenders of this doctrine sadly point to 1 John 5.7. <clears throat> they often use it as a proof text for the trinity. Uh, the old King James Version has it in there, and it says this, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Well, this verse was never used as a proof text for the Trinity in any of the early church councils and in the creeds. You might wonder, well, why is such an obvious statement of the Trinity? Well, it is, but the Trinitarian part of that verse was not part of the original text. There's no ancient manuscript that has it in it. It was added much later. It's believed that it was a marginal note in the Latin Bible, 
and it was copied and translated later into the Greek text. In fact, the early uh, compilers of the Greek New Testament didn't want to include the verse because they didn't know of one Greek text that included it. And as the story goes, when they were challenged uh, by uh, some of the scholars who followed the Latin version, they said, all right, look, if you can show me one Greek text even, I'll put it in. Well, as the story goes, shortly they came with a Greek text and the ink was still wet. But uh, to be truthful to his word, that early scholar included it in one of his editions, I believe it was his third edition of the Greek Testament, with a footnote that there was no documentary support for adding that Trinitarian part of the verse. Uh, it's not in any of our ancient Greek texts, and, but we don't need it. If the Bible is taken as one unified word of God, then the fact of the Trinity becomes very plain and obvious. Uh, each is described, each member of the Trinity, each of the persons is described as having all the attributes of this one true God. And that's how we know that God exists as one God in three persons. Uh, first, God eternally exists as the Father. Now, not many have questioned the, using the title of Father uh, as an appropriate title for God. Uh, the Bible often uses this word to describe his care for his children. Uh, God oversees all of his creation as a father oversees his own household. Uh, God is, in fact, the father as the creator, the father of all people, and as the sovereign head of the whole human race. But he's specially the spiritual father of all who are redeemed in Christ. And we're called the children of God by grace. And it's by that that he makes those redeemed part of his covenant family. And so Jesus prayed to him as father in his prayers as recorded in scripture. So the, there's a fatherhood in God is, is not questioned. <clears throat> but God also exists eternally as the son. Uh, it's tragic that many focus so much on the human side of Jesus as a great teacher, or miracle worker, storyteller, or martyr, whatever, but they lose the wonder of his eternal deity. Our Savior was fully human, but at the same time, he was always also fully God. A union very difficult for us to understand, but one very clearly stated in Scripture. Uh, in John's Gospel, the first chapter, it tells us that uh, Jesus, God the Son, is not a created being. He is, in fact, the Creator, uh, the one who made all things. And he tells us the Son is eternal in that portion and that uh, he's been with the Father forever. Uh, this means that his sonship has nothing to do with his being fathered by God in the sense of having a beginning. Uh, it only has to do with that mysterious relationship between the persons in the Trinity. And there, speaking of himself, uh, or of Jesus rather, as the Word, uh, John's Gospel also says that he is God. In fact, when it says the word was God, uh, there is no uh, definite article in front of that word God. Uh, and that is, is so because when the definite article is missing in Greek, we call it an anarthrous substantive, uh, it means that that word describes the quality of the thing named. So this verse is telling us that Jesus, as the word of God, has this very quality of being God. Uh, and so there can be no question that that's what John intended. Uh, in fact, in Colossians 1.16, it says about Jesus, For by him all things were created, that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. <clears throat> so he was before all creation, so he couldn't have been created. In fact, he was there as creator. And Jesus, we also see, shows submission to the Father's will, a will which was never different from his own desires. But submission doesn't mean inferior. Jesus wasn't inferior to the Father. Uh, this is true of every human relationship where we have superiors and, and, and inferiors. Uh, th that's a whole different type of relationship. But when we talk about submission, that's something different. That means honoring a certain relationship. Uh, in, in a ham human family, uh, the way God set it up, there is submission. The wife, it says, should be in subjection to her husband. But this never means that she's inferior. It doesn't put her down. She's not below the husband. It simply reflects the organization that God intended for the house. Uh, in fact, it puts great responsibility on the husband to love the wife dearly and to love him as Christ loved the church, that is, self-sacrificially, 
So the idea that men should boss their wives around to get their own way is an absolutely anti-biblical concept. Also, uh, husbands, wives, and all Christians are told to be in subjection to one another in Ephesians 5.21. Same concept there. And children are told to be in subjection to their parents, but doesn't mean that children are inferior to their parents. In fact, it tells us that Jesus, as a human child, was in subjection to his parents. It says that in Luke 2.51. That would be Mary and Joseph as he was growing up. But certainly he wasn't inferior to them. And so the relationship of son and father isn't one of superiority and inferiority. It's a one of organization of submission uh, to the respect for the other person's honor. <clears throat> You know, we, we get this distorted idea sometimes that just because someone has a responsibility of leadership or headship that he's better than those he leads. Nothing could be further from the biblical picture of headship. And certainly it's not the case within the Trinity. And not only is God the Son uh, called the eternal creator, who's in every way truly and fully God, he's also identified with the covenant name of God, Jehovah. Uh, in fact, in Joel 2.32, it says, whoever calls on the name of Jehovah will be saved. Now, that verse is quoted in Acts 2.21 and applied directly to Jesus. And there in Acts 1.8 it says, uh, that uh, I'm sorry, Acts 4.12, it says that there is no other name by which we're saved than Jesus. Well, the Bible doesn't contradict itself. Jesus and Jehovah are the same God. Isaiah 43.10, it says we're to be witnesses, witnesses of Jehovah. The Jehovah's Witness cult takes its name from that verse. It says, you are my witnesses, declares Jehovah. And then Acts 1.8, it says we're to be witnesses of Jesus to the whole world. And when John the Baptist came out, uh, it was said in uh, John 1.23 that he was there to fulfill what Isaiah 40 verse 3 said, that he was pre to prepare the way for Jehovah, the way of the Lord. But in John 1.23, he says he's there to prepare the way for Jesus, one and the same person. Isaiah 43.11 says there is no Savior beside Jehovah. And then we compare that with Acts 4.12 in the New Testament about Jesus. It says that salvation only comes by Jesus Christ, who is often called our Savior. Well, there's many other references just like these. I just picked out a few. But uh, what is represented by the name Jehovah also is represented by the name of Jesus in these verses. Uh, he is revealed in the Bible as the eternal God, the Creator, the only Savior. Jesus does things that only God can do. Uh, we're told many times during his in earthly ministry that Jesus forgives individuals for their sins. He performed miracles and cast out demons, not as the disciples did, but it says by his own authority. And we're told to pray to Jesus and through him to God the Father. Many verses tell us that Jesus is the one true God. One of the clear references is the fact that in Matthew 123, Jesus was called Emmanuel. That quote is from Isaiah 7.14. Uh, the word Emmanuel, uh, Emmanuel in Hebrew, uh, is an expression which means God with us. That was Jesus. He was God with us. And Jesus made it clear, too, that he's nothing less than the eternal God who made all things. Before he was arrested, uh, he prayed to God the Father in John 17. And there in verse 5, here's what Jesus said. <clears throat> and now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. So there can be no doubt. Uh, the one we love as our Savior, our Good Shepherd, is the one eternal God, our sovereign creator of all that is. And the Holy Spirit is fully God, too. Genesis 1 tells us that the Spirit of God moved upon the waters during the world's creation. And when the Apostle Paul explained his mission in Rome, he quoted from Isaiah 6. And... Uh, he later said in uh, Acts 28:25, the Holy Spirit spoke rightly through Isaiah, the prophets to our, the prophet to our fathers. So since it was God who spoke through the prophets, the Holy Spirit is said here in Acts as the one who was speaking. And so that's obviously God. 
And so when Paul quotes Isaiah 6, and, and he, he mentions the fact that God spoke through Isaiah, and here we learn that it was the Holy Spirit, we see the two are one. And lying to the Holy Spirit was equated with lying to God in Acts chapter 5, if you compare verses 3 and 4. Titus 3, 5 is another reference where it, it calls our regeneration to life the renewing by the Holy Spirit. Other passages also, uh, uh, he's clearly the one who uh, renews the fallen human heart. And he's also sent then to indwell us uh, as Christ speaks of being in our heart as well. Uh, God is there. And uh, since the Holy Spirit does what only God can do, He's part of the eternal trinity. And he, he lives within the heart of every believer as our eternal creator and Lord. Well, there are passages that actually bring these three persons of the trinity together as one God. Uh, for example, John 15, 26, Jesus promised, he said, When the Helper comes, whom I send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. So there Jesus is putting all together as as persons who are individualized, uh, the helper, which is here mentioned as the Spirit, uh, sent from the Father, sent by Jesus, and so he proceeds both from the Father and the Son, and he testifies of Jesus. So together, these three persons share in creation, in preservation of creation, in regeneration, in judgment, revelation, the ancient miracles, and God's ministry to the saints. Uh, they all are said to receive worship, honor, and glory, which is forbidden to anyone who isn't God. Individually, they communicate with one another, and they reveal uh, one another to man. And so they all play an important part in restoring us to our eternal life in the home of the Lord, and in encouraging us while we live here on earth. Uh, th this high mystery of the doctrine of the Trinity is a living encouragement to all creation, and us particularly, who are his children by grace. The Savior who redeemed us, who intercedes for us, is actually God. The Holy Spirit who sent to live in our hearts and guide us in our beliefs and choices, well, he's not just a powerful angel or some comforting concept, he's fully God. And of course, we can speak directly to God as our Father, uh, we can speak uh, through Jesus, we can uh, call upon the Holy Spirit to uh, fill us and uh, to enable us to do the things God calls us to do. But the fallen mind conceives of a very different kind of God. And so they imagine him as this far-off ethereal concept with little anchor in reality, uh, just some magical power there to help us when we need it. Others, he's still just some superhuman deity like those who struggle against one another on Mount Olympus. And there are those who still confuse the God of the Bible by not putting together what he reveals about himself in his word. But those who are redeemed learn from scripture, maybe not all at once, but we're growing in our understanding of this living God who is our creator, the Lord over all things. And by this unfathomable love and grace, this amazing triune God redeems us to be his children. There's no stronger desire in the heart of any creature anything material or spiritual that can hinder in any way or change in any way the will of God the Father. And there's no evil in all the universe that can attack us, uh, which uh, would be to challenge what God has decreed. Uh, he's been conquered already by the victory of Christ. The evil one cannot defeat us. And there's no trouble, no lie, no doubt that can infest our own souls that isn't overpowered by the Holy Spirit who lives in our hearts through the atoning work of our Savior Jesus Christ who paid for the sins of all his people, all their sins, even knowing beforehand all that they would do. So there's no power on earth or in space all around us that's greater or even equal to the infinite power of our loving triune God. And he's the one who has redeemed us and given us life.